Um, so to talk really about the future of catastrophe modelling, I think it's important um, that we first frame the past and the present. Um, so if I jump into that really quickly, um, let's think about the past. Uh, catastrophe modelling really was born out of uh, some very uh, severe losses in the late 80s, early 1990s that led to a number of insolvencies in the market and it led to some hard reflection, I think, on the part of reinsurers about the current methods that they were using to price and understand risk. It really led to a revolution, obviously, and that birth of the catastrophe modelling industry and at the heart of that birth was effectively uh, trying to understand on an event-based um, methodology um, how to uh, effectively take stochastic processes, so, so statistical methods, apply them to actually the hazard itself, uh, some vulnerability information um, and exposure information to actually more appropriately fill in gaps that maybe we hadn't seen in our loss history um, when thinking about catastrophe modelling. So now that we've uh, got an understanding of where we've come from in the past, um, it's important to reflect on where we are with the present. And the reality is, I think, I'd argue that we haven't really moved past that first philosophical revolution that introduced catastrophe modelling back in the early 90s. The reality is that our methods still are based in this stochastic processes applied to event-based realities. Um, and that leads us, I think, to a number of issues that we have to address and have to be honest with ourselves about. But that's not to say that the revolution of catastrophe modelling wasn't important and it's led to a number of, of successes. So really to try and present and frame the future, we have to both understand the successes and the failures of the present. So the successes of the present, I think, um, for me, are in three key areas. The first and the most major, I think, is the bridges that the catastrophe modelling industry has built between experts in their field um, with regard to specific events um, and the insurance industry. So when I say experts in the field, this can be anyone from scientists, say working on the um, specific aspects of hurricane risk, to uh, engineers who might have expertise with um, vulnerability um, and buildings, and then exposure managers as well. Um, the way that the catastrophe modeling has, uh, industry has managed to bring these um, three key um, areas together and expertise from all three key areas together um, is nothing short of revolutionary and extremely important for us in our thinking going forward. Um, I think there's two other big successes on the back of it uh, that are somewhat in interrelated. The first one is on the actual workflow of the uh, catastrophe modeling industry. So what we're talking about when we actually try to understand catastrophe losses are these extremely complex, extremely large data sets um, that have to be run successfully, that have to be aggregated, disseminated, and really uh, the tools that the catastrophe modeling industry has, has brought to the table allows people with very little training or very little um, uh, early, at least, understanding of these perils to actually be producing key statistics very quickly. Um, and allowing them to communicate things about risk that they obviously wouldn't um, otherwise be able to. Um, so I think there's this um, interplay between uh, workflow and software there that the uh, catastrophe modeling industry has done a remarkable job of. Having said all of that though, there are still, as I mentioned earlier, some key failures in this uh, paradigm that we need to address. The first thing to talk about is that obviously the current paradigm of stochastic events um, and building, say, from 100 years of, of hurricane data, maybe 10,000 to 100,000 years of data to try to fill in the holes, is that that paradigm should be limiting the shocks that the reinsurance industry feels uh, from these types of events. The reality, though, is that still year on year we see these shocks. We still we see effectively people um, unaware that this type of loss could happen. Um, and the reality, not only is it a shock for the reinsurers, but it's also a shock when the catastrophe model vendor turns around and goes, OK, yes, we didn't have this in our model, but we've now edited to include it. So ultimately, there's still this gap there. There's still the, there are still these holes in the current paradigm that aren't being filled in um, by um, the, the risk modelling. And the reality, this leads me on to my second point about the failure, um, or the failures in the current day, and that's um, that there's very widespread distrust of these models. Um, it's not um, difficult to see obviously why that would happen with these shocks, um, but I see this from very junior people in companies right up to board level people who ultimately are very skeptical um, that 
the actual loss output from coming from the models um, is accurate and actually a lot of the work that's done with it by individuals within companies nowadays in this paradigm are addressing model deficiencies and addressing um, and adjusting the models uh, based on what people's perception of those deficiencies are. Um, this leads on to my third point that really we do these um, model adjustments thinking about these deficiencies and yet we still don't have full transparency of the modeling chain. So we, we think we can isolate places where the modeling is going wrong, producing some inaccurate results, uh, but the reality is we don't know, we can't see the full chain of information um, flowing through the models and we almost have to just make these adjustments on blind faith ultimately. Obviously it's, a, it's an informed faith but it's still ultimately blind at least partially. I think again this transparency point then leads onto a further one which is sort of the use of language really. Um, I think catastrophe modelling was built as, we, as I've described um, to serve the reinsurance industry. But the reality is catastrophe modelling shouldn't be seen as that. It's, it's a tool for building resilience um, in communities that need it. Um, but the reality being that with the tools and the workflow and the software that I mentioned as big successes that have been built and tailored for the reinsurance industry, it means that these models don't get translated easily to um, other industries, other financial industries, but other sectors that really need it, so things like aid agencies. Um, that would be working on key resilience aspects of the modelling. And then that obviously flows into probably my most alarming failure of that type of language um, issue, is that when we look at the protection gap um, and think about, well, catastrophe modelling should have helped us close that. It should have helped reinsurers jump into emerging markets and developing markets with confidence that they understand the peril really the protection gap has not been closing, at least at the rate that it should be. Um, and I think that's, a, that's an unfortunate um, and sad reality about catastrophe modelling in the par current paradigm. Related to that, again, is the reality that when we think about that protection gap, one of the big issues um, with trying to develop models in those regions is that it costs a lot of money in the current paradigm to develop um, adequate models. It costs a lot of money to do the research, to build certain aspects, to collect information and it ultimately makes them largely often too expensive to deploy in regions that really need them and that do suffer um, from regular natural peril uh, shocks. Um, but the reality to me is that although the current paradigm suggests that it's very expensive to do that, I'm not necessarily sure that it actually is and if we can alter our thinking slightly I feel like we're going to get a lot more value much more quickly to provide resilience to many more people. From that point, we then have to think about, well, what does the future hold? We, we know where the successes are of this industry now, and we've, I've highlighted a number of places that we, I've, I see in particular serious failures. Um, the first and foremost, I think, if we ultimately I'm suggesting that we need a paradigm shift. We need to move past this concept of stochastic modeling that's been with us since the 90s to at least move to this version 2.0. But the first step in that is to almost, it's an admission that we need to take as an industry, both a reinsurance one and a catastrophe modeling one, about the limits of knowledge. Um, I really believe that um, we've gone so far beyond um, uh, scientific information in just adding complexity, adding precision, um, that really we're not adding value anymore once a model gets to a certain level of sophistication. That leads me on to my sort of second point that we can't quantify the value at the moment in the current paradigm of complexity in models. So we can't quantify the fact that if we take a very basic view of hazard as, as is done by many parametric insurers at the moment, um, and then we add in a catastrophe model, we should be seeing that there's a big jump in value, and yet we've got no methods to quantify that. That's something that we need to address and need to be able to communicate, not only to um, our core business in reinsurance, but to other people and other communities around the world in order to show why catastrophe modeling um, is important and can provide resilience. Um, one of the big things, I think, when we're thinking about limitations of knowledge and over complexity is that at the moment, the current paradigm, I think, is almost a one-size-fits-all, as I've mentioned before. Um, it's effectively, um, the, effectively, people see that the most complex, the most sophisticated views of risk 
um, are, are the most accurate. That's the core belief or the central tenet, I think, of our, um, of our current paradigm. But really, it, that isn't proven. We can't show that. We can't show accuracy. We can't show value. So really, I think, in order to start doing that, we need to have an understanding of the decision space that we're working in. What are the key decisions that people need to make um, in order to um, provide the resilience they have? So a key thing for that when we're thinking about the insurance industry is, well, let's say that you're a direct insurer insuring thousands of residential properties, all very similar type, over a large area of the US. The reality is the model that you need is probably quite a coarse-grained one. It's probably a very simple one. Um, but take, on the other hand, a very catastrophe risk-specific, high return period uh, reinsurer that's um, insuring a very niche industrial plant in a very precise location. There's where you need the complexity. And the same tool does not work for, the same, for, the, for different jobs. Um, but uh, we need to move past that concept and be understanding what it is about certain decisions. Once we've got that for insurance, I feel like we'll be able to start thinking about defining that for other industries as well and be able to really push catastrophe modelling to provide resilience. Um, and on that point, I think the future holds for us ultimately these multi-industry collaborations. There's a number of projects that I've been working on uh, that include other financial sectors, that include charitable um, agencies. They all offer extremely large amounts of information that can be tailored um, and uh, effectively ingested into these models to really provide the resilience that we're looking for. So I see that um, increasing as well. The final point, I think, ultimately, is that the catastrophe modeling industry at present has taken a lot of, taken a lot of criticism um, for its effectively historical looking view in order to provide um, uh, the view of risk in the present day. Um, there's, a, there's very good reason for that, I would argue. Um, it's, it's something that is a very difficult thing to, to communicate, but um, the amount, the variability and volatility of losses, as long as we've got them in our history, the, the way the stochastic methods work, actually mean that it's probably a relatively good view um, of our present day risk right now. But the reality is for many um, different aspects of the uh, risk itself, we are changing very quickly. So obviously we're changing um, in terms of the climate space. Um, there, are, there are very rapid changes at the moment in the climate system. At the moment, I would argue that that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to throw everything out and rethink the modeling in the present day, but we do need to be preparing for what that means going in the future. But there's also other aspects that, that are often ignored as well. So thinking about um, exposure and vulnerability is the two other key pieces of uh, the catastrophe modeling chain. Um, why are we not thinking about predictive modeling of those? When we know we want to report on future risk and we want to inform people about potential for future risk, we seem to be very isolated to the hazard, which is actually, I would argue, probably the most complex piece. And we need to start thinking about ingesting predictive exposures, predictive vulnerability to really inform about future risk. Um, so those are really the key things that I think will eventually occur and will, will cause a large paradigm shift away from what I see as single best estimate precise views of risk to a more um, loose, a, a wider decision space where we know there's a cone of uncertainty and really to collapse the uncertainty we need to uh, understand what a decision means to an individual.